Hey everybody, welcome. We're going to call this meeting to order. So the ONJ Roberts School Board of Directors utilizes the working session process as a way to consider agenda items as one large committee for the purposes of discussion and debate in full view of the public. Time permitting, the committee chairperson may open the meeting up to public questions on the topics being discussed by the committee at the time. Uh, with that, item number two, uh, we're going to have a discussion of district goals tonight. Dr. Stout. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Friel. So for this evening, uh, we want to have a discussion regarding the 2022-2023 uh, district goals and priorities. Just a little bit of, um, of, of an overview or history before we, we get into them this evening. Uh, many of you know we had our comprehensive planning uh, committee meet last year and we developed the, our comprehensive plan that has been approved for the next three to six years. So I say three to six because you're required to do a mid evaluation, but it is the plan that I would like to see our district follow for the next six years. So our, our goals, our district goals are based off of the goals that were developed in the comprehensive plan. So what we have this evening are the, uh, the goals from the comprehensive plan. And then we also have some priorities under each of the goals. What we do not have this evening are the measurables that we typically include in the goals. And if you recall, last year when we did our goals, we did it in this process. We did it in the general overview of the district goals with the priorities. And then our administrative team came back at a later time with the, the measurables or how we're going to measure each of those goals. So what we have tonight are the comprehensive planning goals and then the priorities. So I'm going to have members of my team uh, that are responsible for each of those goals share out their goals. And then we'll take feedback and questions that the board may have in regard to these goals. So I believe the first goal, well, and you'll see on our first slide here, um, the goals associated with the comprehensive plan are student well-being, student success, professional development, communication, and then infrastructure excellence. You've heard me talk at previous meetings about uh, these goals in comparison to our goals last year. And through the process, they seem to be very similar, uh, very familiar, just with some different terminology that came out of the comprehensive plan last year. So the first goal that we have this evening that we will be discussing would be student well-being. I'll turn that over to Mr. Bentman. Got it. Okay. So good evening, uh, school board members, uh, Dr. Stout. So uh, as we created the student well-being goals, we wanted to capture a few uh, important topics, um, stu specifically students feeling safe in the schools, social emotional growth, um, obviously our uh, physical and mental health. And so uh, what we did was uh, we created a three, three specific goals based off of the school perceptions data that we received uh, from last school year that was done in May, um, which is something that uh, we would like to use as the measurables for the student well, well-being goals. Um, so first goal would be to increase the amount of students who report they feel safe at school. So that was a specific question on the school perceptions uh, survey. Number two, increase the amount of students who report if they have a big problem, there is an adult at school they can talk to about it with. And number three, increase the amount of students who report if they were bullied, they would feel comfortable talking to someone about their situation. So for those specific goals, uh, we, we have internal measures that we can use uh, that are could be a little subjective, but the objective measures can be used with the school perceptions data, which is, gives us an idea. And one of the reasons that uh, it's a, a useful tool that we can give at the end of this May, uh, very similar, same questions as last time. Some of the uh, some of the things that we're going to do to incorporate this and uh, focus on these goals is to incorporate self management, self awareness, social awareness, and relationships uh, into morning meetings and also throughout the school day for our, our students social skills lessons. Um, we increase some services in the SAP office. Uh, we are uh, running an MTSS supports in the middle school and the high school, so that's going to be helpful and very beneficial. Uh, obviously, we added a guidance counselor at the middle school that will be helpful to the middle school. The middle school is doing no place for hate this school year, so that'll be a, a nice uh, support and intervention at the middle school. Um, as well as other uh, areas that support our uh, PBIS schools, our positive uh, behavior and support interventions throughout the day. 
and obviously the connections our teachers are making throughout the day each and every day with their with their with their students i could pause there yeah so um just a couple of questions so the first three are, are based on that uh, perception survey um are you looking at making the goals like very generalized on, on the averages or the, or the full roll up? Or are you breaking these down at a building level? Like how, how, what level of detail do you think you're going to be able to get to in terms of your, your measurables? Yeah, uh, so we can go, the detail we can go, I'll start broad. We can start at the school level. Uh, from there, we can go grade level at the buildings that uh, students that take the survey. So we go grade level. From there, I, I could break it down to uh, the only other areas are gender, um, ethnicity, race, and um, I believe those are the three levels that I could break it down. And that's actually based off school perception survey data. Obviously, we can break it down a little more with more subject, subjective data within the, uh, within the school. But using that survey, those are the areas that we can use. So what is the subjective data that you use? Is it disciplinary type of stuff or safe to say reporting? What is, what is it? Uh, we, could, we, could, we could track, for example, um, what supports uh, students are, are, are getting throughout like a tier one, tier two, tier three support. So uh, we, can, we can track uh, students that are being supported by the school counselor, students that are being supported by crisis counselors, students who are being supported by mental health clinicians. Um, we could also track, as you said, safe to stay, or that that's very, that's right there. Safe to say that data is, you know, um, in its pure form as we get our, um, get safe to say uh, results. We can, we also have our Olveus uh, bullying um, um, uh, form, Google form that's on the website for all the schools that students can report bullying incidences that go right to the principal. Uh, so we can use that data as well. Um, we also have our uh, MTSS supports at the middle school and high school and our IST supports at the elementary school. So uh, those folks have uh, worked with students throughout the day and we can support it using that data as well. How, how often is the, um, the survey data? Is it a once a year or twice so, a year? It's a once a year in May. So there's really no check-in on this data then? Well, we used we used a check-in last year for well-being. Uh, we did it three times per year. It was a um, a uh, information given to students uh, in some of the grade, higher grade levels. So there are opportunities for that. But right now, our only plan is to use the data from the school's perception survey. One additional measure that we'll have, and we've talked about it before, the University of Pennsylvania Mental Health Consortium that we'll be doing this year does have some pre and post tests pre and post assessments in there as well to track and see how we're doing and how students are doing as well. Um, I have a question about, and this is a, a broader question about all of the goals um, in, in each part, but um, we keep saying increase. So are we satisfied if we get a 1% increase? Are we satisfied if we have two kids at a higher level on safe to say reporting something? So there's no there's no way to say, we can check that box then that we did that, even if it's one child more than last year. Yeah, and in the general goals that we're presenting tonight, we're using terms like that. But when we look at the metrics and the measurables, we'll have specific benchmarks in there that we're trying to go. Now, obviously, if you have a small group of students, one or two would be great. But if, you have, if you're talking about several thousand students, one or two is insignificant. So we will have some, some of those benchmarks to come. Do, do, do you know if, I mean, what, what's your timing on, do you think, um, completing the benchmarks on the, on the student well-being, and do you think you're going to add in safe to say and that data? I mean, or what? So the safe to say data would be more like, right, so someone, so student uses a safe to say report. They input the information that goes to the team, um, team being the um, principal, myself, uh, assistant principal, if there is one at the building, um, obviously Mr. Mesker, our chief, right? So that information goes there. Once we get that information, we then act on it and support the student. So that data would be more like, we had got a safe, safe report, this is how we handled it, and have there been any issues or any situations prior to that? Um, so that so that's more like multi-step data, not necessarily how many safe to save reports come in. We don't wanna necessarily 
you know, less safe to say reports are better, obviously, but it's we, we also want to make sure we advertise it and, and students are using it. So I don't want to make I don't want to specifically say that we're going to have less safe to say reports because we really it's a, it's a, such a tool we want we want kids to use. Um, th th those will ju those will just be data data points for for uh, as we gather it maybe internal, but in regards to right now what I'm pr what we're presenting is just the using the school perceptions data as a as a as a uh, as a measure, but with that being said, as uh, Mrs. Sabo talked about, we can maybe add a percentage, like percentage increase from 3.75 or 4.13, what that could percentage increase can be. So it's not just like, uh, it's 4.33, not 4.32, so you know we hit that goal. I, know, I have a question about this too. Um, I remember that with this survey, there's student perceptions, one of the lower areas, I'm trying to look for my notes, I can't word this exactly right, but um students did not all students felt like stu other students were behaving properly or being reprimanded for their behavior um when we talk about increase the amount of students who report they feel safe at school i think a prime component is that if something is wrong students should feel that it's going to be handled and that you know like you, it says here you know increase the amount of students who report if they're bullied they would feel comfortable talking to somebody well that's great but don't we want students to feel that if something is happening, I know an adult is going to take care of this and students are not going to be allowed to misbehave or um, get away with all these because I feel like that's what we get with the whole bullying issue is that it's swept under the rug, nobody does anything, there's no repercussions. And I know that sounds really negative, but I, I really w would like to see something on here that students feel that, you know, bad behavior will be addressed and they can feel confident that adults will do that something like that yeah I, I remember that one specifically because it was reported not only by students but it was reported by staff members uh, as well and i think i think one thing to I think one thing to remember is we're looking at goals so what we have here tonight we're looking at some district goals that are overarching I think one thing that's very important to point out, and Brad's coming out of the principal realm where he was a principal last year, is at the building level, we have data teams and they're looking at this data all the time. They're looking at their PBIS, they're looking at their student discipline. So they're evaluating it at that level all the time. So from a district level, we're not looking at it as frequently, we're looking at it more holistically. We're doing the surveys at the end of the year. We're doing some other assessments. I mentioned the University of Pennsylvania. We're not looking at it as closely as they would at the building level. And if I'm being quite honest, I want the building level looking at it more closely because they have the direct impact on kids. So I just want to point out that difference. We're looking at some district goals here, but within the district goals, you have the building principals and the building staff looking at data more readily available for students in their building. Is there, so, a, is there some way we could combine the two a little bit? You know, at the, you know, you know, they're doing it very frequently at the building level. <clears throat> Could we use some of their data? You know, not every day, every day, but you know, every month, every two months, something like that? Yeah, I mean, we, we do have the ability to access their data. I know in, in conversations, we were looking at these board goals once they get approved and once we have the benchmarks, you know, having a mid-year update as well. Uh, so as to where we're going, and at that point, if we're doing a mid-year update, then we would pr be providing the data. Uh, if the board would like that more frequently, that would be something that we could take a look at. Well, and is there some sort of um, data that can be gathered or, or analyzed with regard to uniform disciplinary measures across, I, I would assume across a grade within a school, that that would be probably the most important measure um, because it's less likely that kids would be comparing their experience to kids in other schools, but they would definitely be talking to other people in their grade. Yeah, we're required, I mean, obviously we keep discipline data in, in each school, but we're also required to do the, the safe to say state reports every year for each of our schools in the district as well. So again, we do have the discipline data uh, that, our, that our principals uh, and our staff are looking at. I'm not actually thinking of things that would make it to the, the principal or safe to say level. I'm talking about just, you know, like how many kids are, you know, like which, which teachers are stronger or less strong in terms of enforcing you need to be sitting in your chair type things you know the type of things that teachers can come together if they're discussing it as a group within the grade and you know agree on like this is how we handle this situation because especially in uh, grades where students have multiple teachers and they see 
different teachers implementing different strategies for the same set of students, I'm, I'm sure it's most obvious to them if there is a, a lack of alignment there. And it sounded like the impression of the students would be more positive if there was very clear alignment between the various teachers and exactly how they implement the things that students care about, like cell phone policies, you know, sure. like those sorts of things don't raise up to the building or safe to say level very often, but they're very important to students. Yeah, and it's it, it it's an issue that we've been dealing with in schools for forever, you know, and having those conversations with staff about, you know, being consistent. And I can just give you an example. You mentioned cell phones. I was actually at the faculty meeting at the beginning of the year when uh, Mr. Staltzus was talking about, you know, cell phone, felt cell phone enforcement, and he was very clear in that if, if this is going to work, we all need to be on the same page. We can't have several of you saying, I'm going to be, for lack of better words, the cool teacher and allow you to use your cell phone in class for things, and then you're putting your, your colleagues, you know, at risk of, you know, for, for engaging behavior like that. So it's something I know administratively, and I know the staff wants consistency, but we just need to continue to um, highlight that and then enforce it so that there are consistent measures. I, I feel like we need a goal that's based around the discipline part because it's literally the number one and bottom five for students and the number uh, one and the second one because there's two questions for the teachers um, about discipline also as they're the bottom one. So to have teachers and students or uh, voicing a concern over the discipline in multiple buildings, I think we need to really look at that and focus on something or a goal around discipline and it being um, more evenly distributed on the same page type thing. Because it, it yeah, maybe it could be combined in that that just that first goal, increase the amount of students who report they feel safe at school. Something in there just about you know that discipline will be consistent and. Or so, I don't know something like so it could be reworded to ha to include that. Well, or this I don't know maybe there's right, another spot for it. We, I don't know. Didn't we do really well on the like students who said they felt safe? Aren't we already doing really well on that maybe plain that vanilla way of yeah, asking? That's pretty high. <laughs> well, I, I guess the question for you, Brad, is is. Mm -hmm. What do you think is a meaningful measure in, in student well-being that we get to that won't have a, um, and I, I take your point very, and, and it's a good point you made about we don't want to create a scenario where we're, we put an incentive to drive down a number, like safe to say. That's, that's a big mistake. Or a disciplinary issue and not be, have under-reporting or, or an incentive to not report correctly because of that. So, so what are the appropriate ways that we could get to at the building level student well-being and that's a real measurable goal that we could you know that either exists within the data at the school the building level or that we could in terms of the survey be able to deliver and i think we've got to put some meat on the bone here in terms of hey listen this is our baseline this we're, we're at 80 percent. we think we should be at 90 or I, i'm just making a number up mm -hmm. But, but we have to establish a baseline of what those goals are and what's the accept, minimum, you know, the acceptable and where we're trying to get to. And I do think we have to maybe even underneath some of these bigger bullet points, look down and see if there are cohorts of students that have a different experience, whether it be gender, race, or age, meaning like the middle school, like if that's a problem, or, you know, you see as, as kids get into this age group or that age group where, things, you know, freshman year in high school, you know, and, and what are the appropriate cohorts to measure? What's the baseline and how do we measure them? And then how do we do a check-in? So it's not just an end of the year up, we made it or we didn't make it, right? Something that we can meaningfully get along the way, again, without putting a perverse incentive in there that says, you know, we don't want, we don't want to limit building folks or principals or teachers or put an incentive in there that kind of takes away from you know, what it is we want to accomplish there. I think that's a very valid point. Well, I'm wondering, oh, sorry, I'm gonna, yeah, okay. he's thinking, I'm sure. So, um, <laughs> I'm, two thoughts on this, that the student perception survey, maybe could there could be some more work done on that, just with, if students are improving that, that number, that 
said it was low, you know, as far as students feeling that disciplinary matters are taken care of, it could just be another, just be measured that way, their perception, because like Paul said, you wouldn't want to not report things because that number would look bad then. But the other thing I'm thinking is professional development. Um, you know, perhaps there could be something in professional development just on teachers and consistency of disciplinary measures and how to, you know, be sure that they're fair and whatever, so, something in the teacher with the teachers, because that's the thing about it is when I look at those numbers, there's a little bit of suspicion that, you know, maybe some parents who feel that their child has been bullied and that hasn't been able to be handled would would comment on there, but not all bullying is able to be handled by the school because, you know, it's happening outside of school or whatever, or, you know, we don't have that much control sometimes, and but parents can definitely feel very negative about it if they've had a bad experience. So all because this is complicated and tricky, maybe it's something that needs to fall over more than one category of, of this. Anyway, just some thoughts. Could I ask a question that switching, ta uh, switching gears here for a second? Um, one of the things that I remember that scored really high in percentage wise on the perception survey was students who feel stressed out and students who get really nervous before taking tests. So how does academics fit into these goals in terms of our student well-being? Um, I'm thinking like, could we take a more comprehensive look at how students are being assigned homework? Are they getting too much homework? What is, what, what is the academic environment that's contributing to that, uh, that stress that they're feeling? Um, I feel like that's a gap that seems, I know we're focusing a lot on the safety and security and that's really important, but. I think there's more to it than this. Holistically looking at our student well-being, I think academics has to play a role in that. I would like to see some sort of goal related to that in increasing our student well-being. Brad, are there any new initiatives or efforts at the high school level to increase the number of students who feel they have an adult that they can comfortably speak with? So right, right now at the high school, the big initiative is MTSS, and we are working on trying to uh, incorporate um, behavior, social and emotional um, into that process. Um, so that's something that you know, we're working on, we'd like to work on. Uh, there were small discussions that happened, or some discussions that happened last year, but something that uh, would be the next kind of phase through that process, um, it's just, just, it's just the the big thing is how do we capture that and then and then do we we look at the capacities to to, to support that's really the big thing there's two big areas so if a student's uh, performance or attendance or number of discipline fraction infractions suddenly shows a marked change in direction is that picked up and it is and it then is. what happens Yes. So from that point, the uh, the MTSS team they talk about it, right? So it could be a SAP could go to SAP referral for the SAP office. It could go to um, the guidance counselor. It could be a MTSS meeting for the student. And so at that point, we take a look at all those measures, and they and they and with Link it, we're able to do that now with in one uh, one area. We could take a look at attendance. We could take a look at uh, how their student is doing academically. We could take a look at what discipline looks like, and we use those all those measures to capture what's going on and how we provide those supports for the student. So yes, uh, we just don't have any type of kind of, uh, we don't have like a tier one screener at this point, but we have those sort of metrics, if you will, to provide support for students, if that makes sense. Thank you. And Mr. Doherty, to respond to your question, which is a good point, you know, regarding the homework and the stress and the grades and the academics and I, I know at the high school they, they have some teachers and working with Mr. Kohler uh, on that issue and on grading. One of the things that they did this, this summer is they standardized their Canvas courses for teachers. But when you get into grading practices, that, that's a big mountain to move. Um, and I'm not saying it's insurmountable, but that's a lot of conversations. That's working with staff. That's coming to common ground on what's best for kids. And, and it's changing practice that has been done for a long time. So I know specifically at the high school that they're, they're having those conversations through their MTSS teams and through their departments on, on I'll call it more, more effective grading practices possibly. 
Um, but again, that's a, that's a, that's a big lift, and I'm not making an excuse, but I know it's if that's something that we're looking at, but may take some time. Yeah, I just you know just looking over Dan's shoulders, he's talking about which in the stress here, uh, like I feel too much stress, the nervousness before the test, um, distracting students and distracting behaviors, which I think uh, you know Kathy and April were getting to too. To. I think maybe we take. Take a look at some of these where we had some struggles and, and maybe we can incorporate them into to the metrics here because I think, you know, that feels like a student well being, you know, stress. And I think it's one of those mental health things and it's self reported on three or four different attributes on that survey, that per school perception survey. Well, with I think also the, the distracted by students or distracted behaviors which may be an indication of discipline without, you know, without hitting any of our internal metrics and creating any perverse incentives. So, so I think maybe there are some other pieces of this survey that might be, you know, equal or better, um, or also able to, I think, evaluate that student well-being piece. Sure. And, and the challenge I have is, you know, what's our base, you know, what's our baseline? And where we get, where do we want to go to from a goal, you know, numerically, mm -hmm. and then how do we check in on it? You know, what 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 would you do in in terms of like measuring to that, or yeah, maybe we can't. I don't know, but just just some yep. food for thought. I think there's some things that directly go right to stress it. To Mr. Dockerty's point, look good. Yep, definitely take a look at that. What's nice about the, the you know this this survey in a way that we now have a baseline, right? Last year was our baseline, so we didn't really have a baseline prior to this year. I mean, we've had other surveys throughout the district um, recently. Obviously, during the COVID, we didn't. We I think we took a break maybe for a year or two. But um, I'm going to be honest with you. It's nice to have the school perceptions data because it gives does gives us some benchmark baselines. I'll take a look at the other questions and see what we can do with the stress level and then the, um, the discipline and how the discipline affects the student and the classroom as well. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Um, you mentioned something called no place for hate. Can you tell me what that is? And I, I, or how I, I can find out yeah, what that is. So sure. So uh, the middle school, I, I believe, and I don't want to speak out of turn here, but the middle school uh, applied to be a no place for hate school. Um, they were accepted. I think it is something that is a little difficult because there is a waiting list. Um, and it's an opportunity for the school to be a part of no place for hate and work on um, uh, work on everybody, uh, obviously, uh, equity and work on um, um, a good culture and a good environment at, at the at the middle school. Um, today, I was actually I was, I was in a meeting, uh, meeting with a few folks about uh, their pledge that they're working on for No Place to Hate, um, talking about you know we're all not going to we're not going to we're gonna, not going to do this we're not going to do this and we're going to support and, and take care of everybody so to speak. So um, we can get we can get the board more information on No Place for Hate though. That'd be great. And that's just the middle school that's doing this. Correct. Okay. Yeah. If you could show us some more on that, it'd be great. Yep. We'll get that. So the next one is a goal for attendance. Um, uh, obviously, this is, an, it, this is an area that's extremely important because if students are not here, um, we, it, we, the difficulty learning, right? Um, so something that uh, my department wanted to focus on uh, this year was uh, attendance and increasing the attendance rate. We're gonna be doing some things uh, within the district. Uh, the measurable here will be the attendance rate, and I could break that down into any uh, Skyward information that we have in regards to uh, data. Um, I could have, uh, that's internal information, so we have, uh, we can break that down into, into a plethora of different uh, data sets and different data points. But uh, last year we were at 93.14%. 9, we're currently at 96% right now across the district. So that's our rate. Um, obviously, we're only five or six weeks into school, beginning of the school year, right? Um, keep that in mind as a variable. Uh, we're going to uh, rework the um, attendance letters. Uh, they haven't been looked at in quite, quite some time. So uh, with the help of Michael uh, Communications, uh, reworking those letters. Uh, we're also going to add consistency across the buildings. Um, one thing with COVID was the uh, just keeping up with things is very difficult, specific, specifically with attendance. Uh, so I've been meeting with the attendance clerks and some other folks that are uh, in the departments to um, square away some consistencies 
uh, with, with things. Um, we are gonna move to an automated pilot uh, call center for uh, attendance. So if a student is out and uh, the parent guardian has not called their child out of school, uh, then instead of making personal phone calls, we can make automated ones. We have that system set up and we're gonna pilot it uh, with the middle school and the high school in the next couple of weeks. Um, and that'll allow our, uh, our staff to free up some time to maybe make more connected uh, conversations with students and parents to to take care of them, see what see what their need is. Um, so those are some of the some of the big points. Obviously, we're continuing to partner with uh, the judge and the truancy court. S SAP meetings at the at the high school and the middle school. We have SAP meetings, uh, students attendant improvement plan meetings for students that get to a certain point. We get the guidance counselor involved, and we create a SAP plan for the student. And the success rate for the SAP plan is pretty solid. Uh, once we get to a SAP plan process uh, where we, we, uh, we, we see an increase uh, with attendance. We've added a social worker at the high school. The social worker is going to be supporting the middle school and the high school. Um, and already uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, who is there, has made some great strides in, with, with uh, that, that area uh, for both the middle school and the high school. And uh, we, we do some higher level tier three interventions. We work with a, a company called the Academy through the CCIU that actually goes out and visits students and um, gets them out of bed and bring gets them to school. So we have uh, tier one, tier two, and tier three interventions for students. So my my goal is to our goal is to increase the attendance. Is is the baseline? Do we have a pre COVID baseline as well versus last year? Uh, so this is last year, but I can I can um, I can get a um, I'm sure it's higher, but it, just because it's been a couple years, I figured I would use last year's baseline. Well, I, I would say we should probably also look at pre-COVID baseline, because okay. I think, yeah, it's a little apples to orange. Just so we have that as well, and we have a sense of where we're trying to get to. Yep. Maybe that's your goal, but, you know. Brad, are the tier one, two, and three interventions the same in the elementary grades as they are in the middle and high school grades? It's a good question. They, they, they change a little bit. We do a little bit of a different piece with the middle school and the high school. Um, we've seen at times, this is not every situation, but we've seen at times as this, um, when, they're, when they're little, um, sometimes it could be more of a family or um, uh, family um, difficulty or hardship, whereas they get older, sometimes it's the student doesn't want to come to school. So we have different types of interventions for those, for those levels, so to speak. Um, the middle school and high school have a pretty solid uh, a tardy a program when students are late, coming in late. Um, and so it, it depends. Some of them are similar, some of them are not. We do see more interventions at the middle school and high school level. Okay, because I would suggest to you that they're just kids in bigger bodies at the high school. They have a lot of the same issues. And um, uh, having been the vic victim of this myself, letters especially with older children, can be easily intercepted. So, you know, <laughs> I hope it's not, we sent a letter, so we're on top of that because, <laughs> yeah. The letter, I hope, is just step one. So the last one we have under student well-being is, um, as we all know here, review potential school start times uh, that have secondary students start classes later. And we have that at a community forum last week. We also have a steering committee that has been meeting, and, and that is something that we are, we are deep in right now. Um, and we'll be coming to the board later on this fall, winter, with some recommendations. Thanks, Brad. Next, student success. Move on to Dr. Soder. So our student success goal is taken directly from the comprehensive plan. And so a portion of that, you, you might remember that last year the student success was like 1A and 1B. There was a portion that was academic and then uh, a, a portion that was um, access related. So although that goal is pretty far reaching, the first portion of this is the academic part. And then on the, the next slide, you're gonna see the professional development. And so some of those goals are actually split between myself and, and Mr. Bentman, so he'll be returning. 
So the, the academic portion of these goals has to do with very specific testing that we do, formative assessments throughout the year. So for example, in mathematics, we are looking to increase student achievement in grades two through eight, and then in high school algebra one, whenever the student takes that. And so specifically, 90% of the students are either going to be at that proficient level or show that typical growth we are using our new interim system, or our new system that will capture our interim data, the Linkit. And so um, I think that you saw a demonstration about that earlier uh, last month. And so that's going to be a big part for capturing this information for this goal. For language arts, we actually have two different assessments that are used for the student achievement for uh, English language arts in grades one through six. So you've got that Fontes and Pinnell that we've used before. That's the reading level for our students. Again, looking for students to make that benchmark, 90% of the students to make that benchmark or at least make growth, uh, year's growth from where they begin the school year. Also for grades four through eight and for our high school students when they are taking that uh, uh, literature keystone, same thing. We're gonna be looking for them to have increased achievement looking for them to have that proficient score or to make a, a full year's growth in, in the year. We did include the science academic achievement goal this year. This is for grades four, eight, and the biology when the students take that in, in high school. Again, 95% of the students to meet that benchmark or make growth for, for the school year. So those are the student success academic achievement goals. And I can share with you the other part of this related to professional development. And I'll, Brad, I'll do mine and then I'll have you um, share yours. Our, our offices are both responsible for universal design and, and I'll let Brad offer some more details about that for the core team formation and the professional learning that we're gonna be doing this year related to that. Do wanna talk with you a little bit about the professional training regarding Linkit. So as I said, you had a, a session on that earlier in, in September. We are in the process of putting our power users together in the schools. They've actually had a, an initial training for that. And then they have a four hour training this coming um, October 24th at our next professional development to be getting parts two of, of that training and how they would be using that in schools and sharing that information at data meetings, which will happen then on October, or excuse me, November 8th at the next in-service. So we're gonna be continuing that training throughout the year. We know that we're in revision for ELA, so there's some professional learning associated with that. Specifically, we had um, feedback from the curriculum committee that they would like us to have some feedback from parents, so that's underway with scheduled PTA meetings and uh, while we're completing that audit for the ELA curriculum. We know that the next generation science standards were approved at the state level. So we'll be doing professional learning with our teachers on that. Some of that work has already started. A large portion of that will start this year and continue into next year. And um, we have a new requirement from the state for a second year of induction. So we're going to be doing the professional development planning for that. That must begin at the start of next year with this year's cohort of teachers who are, are new to teaching. And I, I know that Mr. Bentman wants to talk about those first two. So universal design of learning, we're going to be partnering with the, well, you are partnering with the Chester County Intermediate Unit. Uh, we're going to have each building is going to have a core UDL team. Um, this core UDL team is made up of uh, some of the leadership members within the building, some teachers, support staff, and uh, other, other folks to uh, be a part of each team. So five elementary schools, the middle school, and the high school. Uh, training for the team begins on October 24th at the elementary level, and for the other schools, it's going to be, uh, I believe, a few weeks later. But really the goal for UDLs, we're going to, the, the goal is for really to come down to the student level, right? This is a training that's going to help students at the classroom level, um, creating um, ways that we can support students through engagement, representation, action, and expression. So the, really the core of UDL focuses on the what, 
the why, the and the how, and when we're educating students. So it's really down to the, to the point of the lessons, how the lessons are designed in the classroom. Uh, the goal is to uh, students to be able to access the information at their level, how they want to learn it, or how they need to learn it. This is nothing new. This has been around for a long, long time. This is nothing, you know, new. This is not a new program or a new like curriculum we're buying or an out of the box type of deal. This is really best practice in teaching and learning. Um, and uh, I th don't. I think it could, it's coming at a great time. Couldn't come at a better time for many reasons. Number one, we're seeing an increase in um, uh, seeing an increase in evaluations for uh, to evaluate students for uh, disability. We're seeing uh, learning gaps from the pandemic. Uh, we're seeing some of our students from early intervention come in that aren't where they used to be. Um, and we're so we're seeing kind of many different uh, points where this is really going to be a good, uh, nice thing for year one. This is multi year. So this is not just year one. This will grow uh, throughout each year. It also fits very nicely under the MTSS umbrella. And I really want to be specifically clear with this, because as we move forward and we, we, we put some things into place, specifically PD, we don't want to be scattered and we really don't want to be quick hitters. We really want to focus on the big umbrella, which is MTSS or uh, best practice, best teaching, teaching practices, and then kind of bring everything from underneath that. That's where Linkit's coming in, uh, UPenn study consortium, uh, UDL. So this is a very purposeful and planned piece. It's also giving my department and Kathy's department an opportunity to work together with curriculum and people services. And that's one of the things because there are little um, smaller things that are going on between the departments. So this will bring kind of pieces together. So I'm really looking forward to this and, and, and looking at seeing that multi-year process. It also helps with our inclusive um, inclusivity uh, within our buildings. Um, it's one piece to kind of supporting that and being able to meet kids where they're at. Brad, before you, before you move on, just wanted to underscore something that, that Brad said about how this is connected to that MTSS process. This is one of the best ways that we can emphasize tier one instruction, which of course is for all students. And so if, if we have, uh, obviously we have professional development that's associated with tier two and interventions that we provide for students on the academic side, as well as on a behavioral or attendance side or mental health. But this particular, this particular initiative is really underlining, really emphasizing what tier one, what all instruction should look like. And so forming these teams and, and really taking a very close look at individual lessons is just really a great way for us to really kind of get back to basics in classrooms about what we expect all teachers to be doing to increase access and to be providing for all students. And so the University of Pennsylvania, uh, we had Siobhan and Andy talk maybe a month and a half ago on that. Uh, the team is set. So the team members uh, are myself, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Heft at the high school. She's a special education teacher. Uh, we also have uh, Vicki Morgan. She's a high school student assistance counselor. Caroline Gatto, our middle school assistant, uh, student assistance counselor. Dr. Todd Oswald, principal of East uh, Coventry. Uh, Mrs. Caroline Slade, high school assistant principal. She'll bring some good knowledge with the guidance uh, department and her work as an administrator. Uh, Mrs. Kelly Colbert, who's a middle school uh, ELA teacher, and Dr. Brian Schneider, who's one of our school psychologists. So I'm really excited about our team. Um, I was able to squeeze one more person in there, and uh, the IU is good with it. Um, great news, the IU got the grant. So it's twenty six dollars to $28,000 that will not be coming out of our budget which is nice, uh, that'll free up, that's it's able to free up some money to use in other areas. So I'm really uh, happy that we were able to secure the grant. Um, so, and with that, the IU is able to bring in a, some more higher power uh, professional development people to come into the IU. So um, I think uh, many school districts in Chester County have signed on to it and we're looking forward to getting started in November. First meet is November. All right. Do you want to talk about that? This is a this is a big one with two slides to to go through. So, um, and since we're here, why don't we start here and then we can go back to the, the to the other ones. Um, my, you know, each building will develop a universal design core team. So we've done that. Is that a goal or is that a um, we 
a means to achieve a goal, you know, because we've done that, but what, how will you know it's successful? Well, th this year, it's going to be professional development that's provided to that team. So you're going to start by forming that team. They're, they're not all formed yet in, in the schools. Okay. And they're going to have that initial training at the next in service day. So we are just in the infancy of getting that team trained on what this will look like. And then um, making this a bigger, really a, a bigger initiative within each school. So we have to start with a team, we have to provide training for them, and then we'll be meeting monthly with that team for their work on individual lessons in, in the schools. So, so it's so going to be a while. What's a while? What, what's the timeline for this? When, when we first talked about this, we really felt that it would be probably three years before you had a change in every classroom in the school district. Okay. That this is not, this is not, we won't be necessarily halfway finished at the end of this year. This will be something that will need to be continued with training uh, in, in an ongoing way. And when, when we talked about it, we were like, okay, how far do you think we would get year one, year two? And, and so on. We really felt it would be probably three years before we saw a, a big change in every classroom. So you have expectations. You'll form the teams and, and the teams are going to go through a certain set of trainings this year. They're going to meet monthly. Mm -hmm. And then what do you, I guess, I guess, how do you know the team's ready to deploy? Like what's the action that's going to translate into the classroom and when will we start seeing that? I think we'll have a better handle on that after we have those first trainings because everybody's going to be sort of entering this at a different point. There's some people who are creating that access for all learners already. And for some people that might be changing several of their current instructional practices. So uh, I don't know that I can answer that one without, with, without seeing the teachers in action just yet. Like I can think of I can think of teachers for classrooms I've visited for whom, you know, this is going to be um, breathing and for others for whom this might be a very large change. So this is where I struggle as a goal, because you have a goal and I don't it's so vague on what it is that. How do you know if you achieved it this year? Your, you, you know, what's your what's your milestone other than assigning the people? Yeah, I, I think for this year and I, I equate this to some efforts I did previously when we were looking to move to differentiated instruction across the school system. And you, you're looking at professional development, you get early adopters, you train teams of teachers, and then you cycle people through in a two to three year period like Kathy's saying, and then after three years and everyone has been exposed to the training. And then ultimately what you're looking for is an increase in student achievement. I think that's what we're trying to get at. Are we going to see that in, in year one? Not likely because we'll have a small implementation with the team. But whenever you're looking at something comprehensive across the system, it's probably, I would agree with Kathy, like a three year time frame to get everyone through and get everyone trained. But we're starting with the core team in each of the building so that they can receive professional development, pilot things, and then eventually uh, infuse that training with everyone within all of our schools. So I think this is one of these things where there, it's an implementation to get this program up and running, but outside of that, I, I don't know what we would identify as a measurable. Yeah, in I year just, one. Yeah, because yeah. it's hard to, um, for me I, to understand it to say there's not there's no action steps. Saying, hey, we're gonna have 18 I, people tra uh, trained at the end of this year. We'll have implemented, and they will have trained the trainer and and introduced it to this, or we've evaluated, you know, 25 lesson for this you, you know there's not you know i took the word develop to mean that they would be fully trained yeah we would want those teams fully trained by the end of this year yes. absolutely they would they'll have that access this year but could i back up and just ask a very high level question before we dig into all the the detailed ones um when i read all of these items uh, i i think they are very well aligned with student achievement um, and increasing the, you know, the rigor and reliability of the education that we are delivering to students. But when I read the, the description of student success here, it doesn't align. So student success has um, 
multiple pathways, broadening opportunities, eliminating barriers, eliminate opportunity gaps, active participants in the community. I, I don't see any measure here that measures whether our students will be active participants in the community. It, it all looks to me like student achievement improvement. So I would say that for us, that UDL is a big part of providing multiple pathways for student success and broadening those opportunities. So that to me is something that system wide we, we, can, we can accomplish in that way. And, and when, I, when I'm thinking about participating in the community, I guess I think more about that from our student well-being. But I, I guess if you're, if you're thinking of it as like, students advocating or or other other I, I hadn't thought about it that way I really had thought about that more like from a mental health and an, a self advocacy kind of goal so I I've sort of looked at that as saying well we're really taking care of that in in the student well being portion of the goal well, and that UDL and that professional learning is really the the bigger part of the opportunities in in the classroom. And I guess but, the I, way, but I certainly understand that they're the, they're not they're not on the same page. The way that I look at it is, you know, like if you have a student who is struggling and they're not going to do well on tests, you know, they're they're not the the type of student that can be expected to always get really high test scores. To me, those words of broadening opportunities, eliminating barriers, multiple pathways sounds to me like we should be providing them alternate ways to be successful and not just measure how they score on tests well but remember that achievement is benchmark or growth so students who are not necessarily meeting that benchmark we are looking for them to grow academically so if they're even if they're starting at below their current grade level we're looking for them to grow academically in in their classrooms that are in their academics i'm just interested in you know to me those words participants in the community broad, building opportunities it just sounds to me like it it involves something that isn't just academics and i'm just not seeing any goals that address anything that isn't just academics that's all so um i i hear you saying about udl and i'm excited about udl to be honest with you um i think it's a great opportunity for us um and I, I agree where you say that it's going to, you know, the professional development new deal will affect our goals in student success and student well being. However, we're also saying that this is a three year rollout and the only thing we're going to do this year is basically get the team together. So there won't really be related to UDL a direct effect on our students at this point. Correct. It's a little soon to say okay. because they're going to be having that professional learning starting this month. Yeah. So like I said, there's some teachers who, as, as Dr. Stout said, are really going to be early adopters for this mm -hmm. um, and some that are going to need much more, much more training. So could you, have some, could you have some initiative or momentum with it right away? You may. I just I really can't predict that until we start that professional learning. Um, you also said that, well, Brad said that UDL is not new or anything like that. This is not some big new thing we're doing. It's basically using finding best practices again and kind of getting them back into the classroom. So how are, is it that we have people that need help on this? Did they, is it their lack of training in their college? Like, what is it that causes these teachers to come in and not be able to already have this in place? So I'm not sure that every teacher would have had that vocabulary necessarily in pre-service training or in earlier professional learning. You're going to have you're going to have best practices in in a particular subject area that are going to hit many of the components that Brad mentioned earlier when he was talking about this, um, and and some teachers who are already doing those things. But it it, it is certainly isn't consistent, mm -hmm. and it hasn't been a professional development initiative for us in the time that I have been here. There have been others, there just hasn't been this one for all teachers. How long has this been around, this UDL? A long time. Long so time. would you say then that this is just a tool we're using to get our entire staff in a more consistent place on how to... For, for tier one instruction. Okay, interesting. Okay, thanks. Good way to put it. I had a question around um, equity of access to AP programming. 
up. Like when I look through the course selection book, I see that a lot of the prerequisites have to do with teacher averages. But, and since these are gateway courses like algebra and, ge and biology, are the teachers using consistent measures of if I'm getting the algebra content or not? Or is it like dependent, you know, one teacher weighs homework much more heavily than another teacher, so I could know as much algebra as this other child, but um, I don't do my homework as regularly as, as that other child. But mm -hmm. does that, is that the best indicator of do I know algebra one and hence I'm screened out of that equity of access? So great, great question. So those courses that have uh, a keystone have much more consistency. And obviously when you have multiple teachers um, teaching the same class within a department, that is work that the supervisors and the high school administration regularly look at. So there'll be a range that they need to stay in for um, a certain portion of the grade, like their tests, their homework, their quizzes, and, and the like. Um, and it's going to vary by subject, so it, it's not necessarily um, the same for each department, but for those common courses, you're going to have much more consistency. And when, I, when you're thinking about the classes that have those prerequisites for um, advanced placement, those are, all, those are in those tested subjects. So, um, but I would say that when we have students who wish to take a class and haven't been recommended for it, that's a conversation that they should have to start with, with the teacher, with their guidance counselor. And the, the high school administration has made those changes for, for students. We also have the opportunity, I mean, it's just this week, right? Just this week, the students in the high school will be taking the PSAT. And so that um, score, when the students receive that, actually comes with information for students who might be successful in an advanced placement course. And so that's information that the high school administration and the guidance office will consider. So if a student, for example, has not enrolled in, in an advanced placement class, they may call the student and say, hey, listen, you know, based on this score, based on the information that we've received, this might be something you should really be thinking about. So um, the, there's, there's more than one way that the student could, could be in, in the class. And the high school administration has permitted students to take classes when their family wishes for them to take something different. And high school students know this to be the case? Um, I mean, in their, in their program of studies, that's part of their, you know, you, know, you have the conversation with, with your teacher. That's actually one of the recommended actions when they're selecting courses. It sounds like one of the goals of the UDL training would be that teachers are more consistent in how they evaluate students. Mm -hmm. But since we're talking, talking at least three years old for that, <laughs> my suggestion would be you come up with a standard <laughs> indicator first of do I know algebra or don't I know algebra, and then work backwards to the right. UDL goals but, rather than have three years more worth of kids that you know have to know about the appeal process and yeah I, I mean it's it's not that formal and I would say again for those tested subjects that's where we have that's where you have the greatest consistency because the teachers are preparing students for a common assessment so where you have elective courses where where it's um, a singleton you're going to obviously you're not going to have that that consistency but for your tested subjects you you really do right now okay thank you well I, I but i hear i mean there's nuance in that language we don't have a consistent assessment that everybody takes right so I'm algebra well, one, no. I don't have the same test. Yes, Remember? you do. So I do I have yes, identical do. test assessments for algebra one. Yeah, every Okay, one for, so they're not different. All for right. midterms, finals, and for your keystones, all of those things are consistent. Yes, for the same course, yes. Okay. So I think one of the things I'm struggling with when we're looking at these goals is, especially since we're, we're later in the year, and I think in order, I feel like for me to better understand where we're trying to move with these and what exactly you're trying to measure, I would like to see what what you're going to use to measure 
for these goals? What is this, like, what is the increase? What are you trying to actually achieve? Because um, this, these are so broad. For the, for the. No, no, I'm talking about persons? just in general. This is overall for all of these goals. Okay. Like, they're so broad and then they don't have, they don't tell us what we're trying to exactly achieve. Like, how much? Is it 1%? Is it 5%? Is it 10%? Like, or is it two kids? Is it, I just, I feel like we need the measurables. We need to understand what exactly we're looking at when we're going to, what are, what are we measuring? And then what are we using to measure so we can better understand all of these goals? Um, for the academic ones, we have percents, we have the assessments, and we're, we're have very clear where, where, where we're starting, where, where we'd like to end. For the professional development ones, I mean, this, this does vary. This, you know, some of this is, will be very dependent on where, where the teachers are and their response to the training. So I, understand, I understand what you're saying. I understand the frustration with that. I think the ones where we can have things very specific, we're endeavoring to do that. So on, on that topic, increased student achievement in mathematics in grades two through eight, you're gonna have a specific benchmark and a percentage on that. Yeah, do you want me to read it to you? And no, well, let me let me finish uh, my question first. Because um, you mentioned, you know, eliminate opportunity gaps and work to ensure all students are, you know, making progress or growth. So the, the one thing I, I thought I heard you say in the beginning when you mentioned some of those goals is at least one year's growth. If I'm at a gap and I have one year's growth, I've not made any progress on my gap. I'm going to continue to be behind by an equal amount each year. So that doesn't feel like a good goal. It feels like we should increase that goal to make up some of that gap. doesn't mean I don't think you have to achieve the whole gap. If I'm reading first grade and I'm in third grade, I might make that full leap. But if I just go from first to second, and now I'm up in fourth, that doesn't feel like we've made progress. That just feels like we've maintained the gap versus closed the gap. So I that think you be... have to be careful there too, though, because when we also look at student stress and, and such, you, you, if you're asking for a year's growth, you also have to look at what student you're asking a year's growth from. I'm talking because, aggregate only, not individual students, right? I'm only talking an aggregate across the district. If we have a population of students that are behind and we do not make progress in growing those students beyond and make any progress on the gap, I don't think that's a good goal. Right, and I, I would say here, Mr. Friel, like for these goals, we're looking at the district level, but when we're looking at individual students in the building and they're getting our, our supports, particularly tier three, we're pulling them out of classes, we are looking for those students to gain more than a year. And we're giving them intense services. But at the district level, we wanted to, like Kathy said, we do have more specific goals, but we didn't break it down by that individual subgroup for our district level goals. Can you reread the first, the, 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 you in the beginning told us you had, sure. can you reread those goals? So, but let me also just suggest that, because I, I understand what you're saying, you, if, if they only ever make one year, then they're, they're still behind. So the goal every time is that the student is meeting benchmark, and if they're meeting benchmark, they're at their grade level. So that, that child is, who's in third grade, who's reading at that first grade level, your goal every time is to get them to third grade benchmark. So you're, you're hoping for that, but you recognize that for, that for some children, they may only make that one year's growth, okay? They, they may only get there. Right. But you are, the, the, the goal for every teacher is to get that child to grade level at benchmark. But so specifically, so this is the, the one for math. Increased student achievement in mathematics in grades two through eight, high school algebra one, as measured by Lincoln benchmark assessment scores, specifically 90% of the students will either score proficient on that Lincoln benchmark C, that's their April, or make that 75% growth measure um, from fall to April. Remember, they're taking this before, before the end of the year. So very clear for what you're looking at for, for benchmark, and that's always that's always the goal is that you're bringing the student to their to their grade level. We put support, we put additional supports this year in place to provide more intervention services that, that Dr. Stout, Stout suggested. So we have additional reading teachers and additional math specialists, for example, in, in the elementary level in an effort to be bringing students to that grade level benchmark. That's, that's the whole 
That's the whole goal for them. And so you're looking for them to make more than a year's growth in, in a year's time for, for students who can. That's really what you're trying to do. Okay, so the so how do we, so we're 90% achievement of the benchmark and link it, that's the goal. Okay. And in terms of students that are below a benchmark in, in grade, that's just individual at, at building level stuff. That yes. That is not measured in terms of a, a Say core, I almost said corporate. I got to call it, catch yeah. myself. Yeah. Um, an aggregated goal. We do we do both. We look at the growth of every student, and we look at the benchmark level of every student. We look at both. And the growth is one year. The, that's the goal. So envision for us three years from now. There's been a successful implementation of UDL. How does the classroom, how does the school look differently if we were to go through classrooms now versus three years? I think you'd have potentially more inclusive practices um, and you would have you would have students who are accessing that content perhaps in more ways than they are now. So if you if you think about a lot of our services for students who need assistance might be outside of the classroom, perhaps they'd be accessing that content more regularly in their classroom. Perhaps those teachers are going to be using more tools that we are seeing in our intervention levels in perhaps in our special education classrooms that they would have greater access to to their content in their classroom in their regular general education classroom. So the teachers that are going through this training this year, are, are you going to, or is Brad going to, or the principals, are they going to get feedback saying, here's how I'm changing my classroom practices based on this training? I think that's a big part, and Brad is nodding, I think that's a big part of the, of the monthly meetings that we would be having, that there's a reflective nature of this that, you know, here's a practice, how can you make this happen in your own classroom? You know, here's a particular tool. How can you make this happen in your own practice? So I think that those are things that the teachers would be engaged in throughout their training. Well, I think that would be an interesting report here for the board. Like and the so it's like, like I said, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you what that will look like just now right, because right. we haven't started that professional right. um, time yet with the IU. It would be good to hear from the teachers, though. Here's when the light bulb went off for me, and here's when I'm doing differently for children. Okay. I feel like I, I feel like um, UDL might need to be explained a little bit more and a little better. Um, and I don't know if we want to have a presentation or something on it about UDL. Um, but my understanding of it a little bit more is you're reaching kids at all different learning abilities and all different learning styles. So you're bringing in multiple styles of learning. So you're trying to hit you know kids that learn visually, children that learn by touch, children like multiple ways that kids take in information. So you're reaching multiple students at different levels of need, different learning styles, different learning abilities, and you're able to increase rigor by adding on more information, and, but you're still delivering the basic and core of the curriculum to the students that need the core level of curriculum. So I think maybe having a presentation or, or something on UDL so there's a better understanding of, of what it is. I think the feedback from teachers saying, yeah. I'm doing this differently because. Yeah. Maybe something we can plan for the spring after they've had some more of the training. Yeah. Um, so I've got a two-part question. One, and maybe you've said this already and missed it, I apologize, but I was wondering if you could explain to me how did you identify the goals for student success, for instance, focusing in on specific grades and specific subjects? And two, I heard a lot of talk about closing this gap in student achievement, and I'm just wondering how to put this tactfully. Isn't, this, isn't that something that should be part of the job description of our teachers every day to close that achievement gap? How is that a goal? I'm looking for things that are aspirational that are going to move the district forward. So what is the goal that's aspirational that we're looking to move the district forward in terms of student success? Okay, 
great, great question. So I would say that when, when you're seeing that student success goal, the one that's in comprehensive plan, I would say there's your, op, the, your aspirational goal. And actually that's the term that one of our former board members used to call it. So I really would say that is the aspirational goal. The, the, actual, the actual grade levels, the subjects, these are where we're getting our formative data. And I would say to you that our teachers have that as that goal of really trying to get the student to be academically successful, to really support their well-being. I would say to you that that really is the priority for our teachers. And it would, it would simply depend on their content. If you, if you walk into a music class, that, that teacher wants those students to perform as best they can. If you walk into a mathematics class, that teacher wants those students to perform in mathematics as best they can, and, and, and so on. And so I would say to you that that absolutely is what our teachers are trying to do every day. These particular tests, these particular grade levels are where we're getting our, our um, informal data, our, our informal testing along the, along the path, our formative data. And so that's what we use to measure academic success. So we, we know that we can't use just the PSSA and Keystones because we don't actually have that data at the end of the year. So we need to use the formative assessments prior to that. And th this is what we currently use. We have a new system, but this is, these are the tests and grade levels that we currently are testing that in an effort to get those students to be successful academically. You know, it, it seems intuitive that UDL would increase student achievement, but it's not the only thing we're doing, right? It's not the only thing that we're doing. So after three years, student achievement increases. How do we know it's because of UDL, something else, or a combination of, of methods? Right. You, you may not. I mean, I, 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 there's a lot of confounding variables there. And remember, this is meant to be tier one. This is meant to be instruction for all students. So, you know, when you are working with a pupil services staff who are providing supports for tier two and tier three students, obviously the better those students do, it's going to raise academic achievement. It's going to, it's going to bring your test scores up. So we would be able to, you know, disaggregate the data enough to say, you know, this group of students is contributing this amount to the, to the overall, but you're right. You are looking for the whole system to, to improve. This is an area of focus for us right now, tier one. So just, have we taken assessment, let's just take the math um, and link it this year yet? And do we know where our baseline is um, in terms of a student proficiency? They're, they're doing that that's, un, that's happening right now. And then they'll have those data meetings in early November when they have all of their fall data. So that's going on right now. Okay, so we would have a good, you know, after that point, end of November, a good check-in point to say, here's our baseline on the Lincoln. We would, we would. That's what we would be using, like when we give you those updates throughout the year, that first set of assessments. So if 95% of the students are proficient in the first level, then maybe we can revise our goal, act, you oh. know. And remember that that benchmark level changes fall, winter, spring. So. It, let's suppose, let's suppose that you were at 90% in, in the fall. That's the fall benchmark. That's mm -hmm. not the spring benchmark. So your students have to meet the winter and meet the spring benchmark. So yeah. it changes. I understand that, but I mean, again, I, I just think to, to Dan's point, and only sort of ask for, if you're trying to grow, right? It, you know, the whole discussion here, I think in a nutshell is, can we increase the, the, the level our students are performing, give students more opportunities to, to be more challenged, and can we improve the academic performance of the district as a whole, right? That, that's sort of the nutshell of this thing. And in order to measure that, we only have so many types of measurements. You know, we have the key sense, PSSAs, and SAT scores, but then we have this link, and we have other best benchmark assessments. If, if I'm thinking, you know, what do we want? We want it to be to grow. So for 90% this year, and we achieve that goal, we want to be at 92% or, you know, we want to move that up. Or if we have different cohorts and have and say, hey, for the tier one students that don't have interventions, they should be at 93 or 94% or 95%. For students with the tier two interventions, we're here now, we want to go to here because we're putting in these 
you know, mm -hmm. whatever, t you know, those tactics I look at the other side are more like, you know, action steps that will help us achieve goals as opposed to goals in themselves. So I get, you know, I just, I just think we, you know, kind of where's the, where's the goal the, on the, on the horizon that we're aiming for and where we're trying to get, get, get to, you know, is, is on the long-term path here and how are we going to continue to move it in that direction? Where's the aspirational goal versus like achieving the benchmark proficiency? And I get it. A hundred percent is the goal. Are we going to achieve 100%? But what's a real goal? What's, can we, to get to 100, we're going to have to pass 91, and we have to pass 92, and we have to pass 93. Right. And what are we doing to get there? And, and that's sort of where I'm... My question for the rest of the board, and if I can you know, ask the rest of the board right now, are we satisfied with student success this year being defined in our goals only in terms of achievement against assessments? Because when I read you know, the Owen J. Roberts graduate, they're driven by honesty, integrity, empathy, embraces uniqueness, responsible citizens. Those things aren't measured on right. those standardized tests. You know, if we're talking aspirational, we're talking about active participants in the community. We're talking about, um, you know, successful adults. Not all successful adults do well on tests. That's reality. <laughs> so is the board comfortable with only measuring the success of our students on these assessments well i think the student well-being hits a lot of those things that you're talking about though because it's really hard to measure as everybody's honest you know i mean it would be nice right but you know if we if we are able to do all those things on that student well-being list then we probably will be achieving some of those other things as well as a byproduct or as part of that I think that's the academic thing. We're sort of separating all those things, and you're kind of wanting them all to be together. Uh, no, I'm not wanting them to be all together. Well, I'm just saying that we should rewrite the student success to to specifically call out that this is the the goal around academic achievement. Because well, I don't see instead of calling it student success, you want to call it academic achievement because it's just not. Because, uh, no, I just want the the blurb there to match. Yeah. Because when I look at the blurb, I see. Like I said, all these things that are not in there, multiple pathways, eliminating barriers, active participants in the community. I'm not seeing goals that are built around those words. I'm seeing goals that are built around quality education, implementing best practices, improving mm -hmm. achievement and performance, making progress and growth. Yeah, th those, th those are a different set of words than what I'm seeing here. That's, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. I, yeah. I think our wording should match. Well, and also what you're saying, though, too, is some of the things that's under that student success for, like, for example, providing multiple pathways is really being met by the professional de development that we're trying to offer teachers to help them. So maybe it's just not it's not congruent the way it's um, worded. You know what I'm saying? Like right. The wording's good, but like part of that student success blurb really belongs. Down. Well, and yeah. honestly, when I see multiple pathways for student success, I also think about, you know, opportunities like plugging them into TCHS programs or um, bringing in um, opportunities for them to get real life experience at the high school level with like an internship program. Like those are the sorts of things that come to mind when I look at multiple pathways for success and active participants yeah. in the community. And I'm just, it's, it's the wrong dimension Increasing compared to what I'm seeing. That type of, yeah. Yeah. So, so it, you know, I, I'm not saying that any of these goals are bad, just that they don't match the words that I'm seeing. Well, and an increase in student involvement could be through extracurricular activities as well. Mm -hmm. You have right. service-oriented extracurriculars um, and one, uh, goals that activities that are tied to like future jobs and roles in the extracurricular program. So that might be something where that could be measured. Like we are promoting better all our extracurricular programs to increase student and student and community programs too. And I, community, mean, yeah. I mean if yeah. kids get opportunities I think yeah like the broadening opportunities and eliminating barriers putting something in here that kind of meets those two two things you got a little bit on that when you're talking about the equity of the assessment process for like AP that's one example that's academic focus but there's other ones for access to whatever government or 
after school curriculum. Well, stuff. another yeah. to make this really messy, yeah. under student well-being, um, there you know there could be something about how many students know what available opportunities are there for them in their educational process. How many have met with a guidance counselor to make an educational plan, and so they know that they want to go to THS or they want to be, get in this AP class or whatever. Like those are other things that could maybe be added on there in some way, just to make it really complicated. <laughs> Yeah. Or even, I don't want to shoot myself for saying this, <laughs> but we talk about eliminated barriers, eliminating in any type of things that might be impediments to a schedule. So if there were classes or requirements, I'm not going to say the words, um, but that was, that's in eliminating, I'm stopping myself. But yeah, just stop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, eliminating barriers. But seriously, that's a that's a real thing. Like you know, it, and it could be to take art class because I want to take photography class. I want to do this. What you know, whatever it is. You know, what are we doing to achieve that goal? So I think that's that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think think it's a good point. It's tough to measure some of those things, um, but if I'm being honest, I. I I know we maybe need a little bit more detail here, but listening to Kathy, and I'm pretty excited about the work that we're going to be doing this year, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what we're doing this year and coming out of the pandemic and where we're at. I mean, last year, and I've been quite honest with this, I mean, it, it was a tough year and a lot of our best laid plans never came to fruition. And what I'm seeing in the first two months of this school year is that these services that we're putting in place, kids are accessing them, which they didn't have access to them last year. So. We'll, we'll tweak some of these things and we'll, we'll go back and, and, and try and have some, some better language. And, and certainly I said some measurables before, but what I'm seeing in schools excites me a lot this year. Um, even we were talking about Lincoln. I was in when teachers were giving it at East Coventry last week and they were just remarking and showing me how they instantaneously got the results from the kids. So they were able to identify where kids were and were already starting to plan what they were gonna do to help those kids. I was not seeing that type of effort last year because we were in triage mode. So maybe some of the wording is lacking and we'll, we'll, we'll get there, but I just want to emphasize I'm excited about what I'm actually seeing happening in schools this year compared to last year. And my criticism is not saying that these sure. goals are bad. I just want to make that very clear. Yeah. <laughs> are last year's assessment results available yet? They're not on the Future Ready site yet. Um, I, I would imagine that will happen probably by the end of the month when they have the growth data available that usually comes in late October. But um, I, the, the first preview that we had was the demographic um, preview. We haven't gotten any word about the, the data preview yet. So not entirely sure. I mean, I would hope later this month. And when, when those are available, are we going to get to see those I mean, as a we whole? Have, we have the preliminary, we, you know, we have the preliminary results. We just don't have what is on the public side of future ready. So that's just how, how it goes with the state. Yeah, we, and to answer your question, though, yes, once we have the data, we can share that with the board, and we, we do. I think that would help. I mean, in terms of especially looking at the, the goals yeah. we just laid out, it would help to know exactly what it is we're, we're, you know, we're trying to, what, with the needle we're trying to move here, yeah. you know. But I would agree with what Paul said earlier. We've got to be careful with our baseline because our baseline from last year with the pandemic in the last two years has been very low. So I think we have to be careful. We're not just focusing on last year, but we're looking at pre-pandemic too to compare apples to apples. So then the goal to that point then are the goals that we're looking at here are, are they trying to increase over what we've experienced last year or are we looking at from two years ago? Yep I'll, I'll let Kathy answer that. You're always looking for the students to meet that benchmark so I, I mean like when I think about where we were pre-pandemic compared to the last two years we are seeking that pre-pandemic level absolutely. And, and just to reiterate, I'm pretty excited about where we are and link it and all the measurables. And I know I'm a pain in the ass with, with the data stuff. Um, but I think we're really putting tools in place that are going to be helpful. And I think we're, we're not far from getting um, these goals in a place where I think both on a measurable point of view and then sort of to, to Jennifer's point of 
making sure it's not just that, that it's not a one dimensional student we're looking at, that, that our students are defined beyond just that, I think is a very you know, good point. And I think, you know, I'm talking about MTSS and all these sports, it's really positive. So I don't wanna, I know we're coming at you hard on this stuff, but we are pretty excited about where we're headed and I think you're making meaningful steps. So, yeah. you know. I, I appreciate it. And I don't, I don't think you're being hard on us. You're asking questions and that's the purpose of the board working session to get feedback and input from you. And we'll, but we'll provide the information. But I just, wanted to, I just wanted to share that. I'm really excited about what I'm seeing in our schools. Okay. Next, Jackie, that's you. <laughs> you just jinxed it. is the community input we received oh sorry thank you um, just to reiterate developing a 10-year capital plan that prioritizes the community input that we received during the 2019 feasibility study um, and also having the 10-year plan informed by our current enrollment projections we really need to marry those two together to come up with a viable plan so I know that uh, Mr. Bentman is working on the projections so we're hopefully, and we're gonna kick off some of this discussion in the next section of this meeting um, under finance and buildings and grounds. So next would be to engage stakeholders in the 23-24 budget development process and focus on resource allocation that prioritizes student growth and wellness. Uh, we're going to have a series of town hall meetings. Um, I think we can glean information from there. Um, we have. Michael with us now to help with our communication piece. So we really are going to work hard this year to make sure we're um, out there receiving input and feedback as we go through the budget development process. And then lastly is really a human resources goal, but it infiltrates the entire district. <laughs> so diversifying staff to create a more inclusive and diverse learning environment. Um, so we are we are obviously working on the measurement, the measurables as Dr. Stout um, discussed with you earlier. And for example, I'll just give you a quick example. We, we are going out to bid next week on some of the projects that have been in plan, we've been planning for all along. So the security and um, stadium Wi-Fi, as well as the high school library and LGI. They will all be going out to bid next week, and so we will be hopefully awarding contracts and, and keeping that rolling along, but also developing this 10-year plan. We'll need to get updated cost estimates, et cetera. Also making sure we're prioritizing the traffic flow on the main campus. As you know, we're in the process of having two different, a traffic study done as well as a transportation study. So we're going to use that information to inform the recommendations that go into the 10-year capital plan. And we want to make sure that we are considering, uh, 10 years is a long time, so we wanna make sure as we're developing the plan, we're considering things that may happen five, 10 years from now. So things may have to be phased, but we wanna make sure we know what's on the horizon as we plan things that are coming up sooner rather than later. And part of one of those priorities will also be to engage an architect firm to help us with the cost estimates that I referred to earlier. Any this questions? is more of a question for sure. Will than for you. Mm -hmm. Are we looking to the overall spending to see if there's any, or there are any opportunities to um, reduce where there are redundancies or inefficiencies, programs that may be running that are not attracting student interest, um, electives that aren't attracting students the way it was hoped, so that we're not just adding all the time yeah good question and that's something that we're we're looking to do every year um, particularly at the high school our courses are driven by student enrollment so the kids sign up for those courses but but obviously we are looking at, at programs and if there's a trend over time of programs under enrolling that's something that we consider in, in our course planning and in, in, in more importantly in our budgeting process yeah. 
Jackie, do you think the 2019 feasibility study is still relevant? I mean, we're, that's now going to be what? What's my math? Three, three, four years old at this point. Like, do you do you think that? What's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I jump, did I jump ahead on something ask there? Me that question. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, there are parts of that that are still very relevant. And when, you, when we get to the next section and you look into the schedule, you'll see some of the things that we're working on and ticking off. It's the top part of that schedule that really came from the community and the input as to where we want programs and services to go that we may want to take a look at. So. Plus there are things on the tenure plan which we've actually already done. So they'll, they'll be taken off the list. Correct, yep, and you'll, you'll see that in the next section. And then on our wellness plan, we have evaluating a different start time for the school. And I know other times that we've done that evaluation, there were budget impacts. Do you feel like you need a separate goal under infrastructure excellence, or do you feel like it's sufficient to have it under the wellness section? I think it's a combination of things. It's prioritized under the wellness section, as it should be, because we're doing what's best for students. Um, and then the budget, it will actually, it will be part of our budget discussions inherently because whatever we're budgeting, we're prioritizing that resource allocation based on what we deem are best for students. So I, I don't know that we need a separate budget goal for it. I think it's, it's appropriate under the wellness goal, but open to discussion. Yeah, and I was thinking, I needed to include that goal and was looking for a place to put it and felt that it, it, it most closely aligned with the with the well-being but if it's something that we decide to do as a board and district then it would it would overlap with infrastructure as well anything else for jackie okay and then michael i think we have you for our communication goal Thank you very much. So I think one of our uh, your big things that it's kind of overarching here is um, you know, there are times we have to create new tools for you know, to better communicate with the public as well. Um, but some of it is, is utilizing some of the tools that we have here. So uh, the, the overarching goal for all of this is uh, you know, to build and strengthen uh, communication methods to all of our different stakeholders, parents, students, staff, et cetera. Um, we tend to view that as as bridge building. Um, those should be two way channels that we that we build, and really not just, um, for lack of a term, talking at stakeholders, but talking with them and having some of those discussions and giving them opportunities to uh, engage with us uh, and to talk about some of those issues that are most important to them, whether it's special education, whether it is finance, through some of those uh, community forums. Uh, one of the first ones, and Brad's gonna touch on it a little bit is the special education outreach, uh, and then I'll pick it up from there and talk about how that dovetails. All right, thanks, Michael. So first up, we have a increased parent community outreach with, in regard to special education programs and services. Um, we have two uh, listening sessions set up already, uh, or it's just recently scheduled, I should say. Uh, first one's gonna be December 7th in the middle school LGI. Um, that will be an in-person listening session, and then on December 14th, virtual session via Zoom will be set up. So we're going to be sending parent communication home probably sometime next week or the following week to get information out. We're going to have a RSVP uh, sign up as well, so we can make sure we get the Zoom link out to those attending virtual and then just be um, ready to go for the 7th for the in-person session. So details coming on that. We also um, are going to present the cyclical monitoring survey data at the November board workshop. Um, and from that, uh, some things, some action items that we have uh, going to move forward with, redesigning the uh, student services website portion uh, of the district website, providing parent training in some, some uh, specific areas. Uh, we're going to be implementing a new special education uh, family or community uh, newsletter to go out to uh, parents and guardians, uh, develop a partnership uh, parent and district student kind of services alliance committee, and that's like a real rough draft of what that is, but we're going to uh, be having a um, 
new group started uh, that will be um, supported by the community and uh, the school district as well. Uh, we're going to do some other things is creating maybe like a welcome to special education supports and services sheet for new parents and really trying to hone in on um, what areas we need to look at. So uh, those listening sessions, I think, are going to be key. We'll gather a lot of information from there and then continue to refine and retool with some of our action items. So these measurables are going to be not only action items from um, a lot of the things that we're doing, uh, but also moving forward from that and uh, getting that information. So we, we're still working on retaining information from the community. One of our, oh, forgot Brad's a little shorter than I. Uh, one of our, <laughs> one of our uh, other priorities is to utilize surveys and listening sessions for purposes other than the uh, uh, special education forms as well. So I know, and I, I know, uh, we put this out there. We have a couple of community forums that are scheduled as well coming up. We are looking at one on November first. Uh, and that is at the uh, that is at the Henrietta Hankin uh, Library in West Vincent Township, and then on November seventh, we have one at the East Vincent Township building as well. Um, those are the start of some of those town hall meetings that we're looking to have, where it is an open invitation for the community to come in and to talk about the issues and questions that they have coming in. It's uh, you know time for us to. To me with them, I know, you know, even from my, uh, my month and a half here with the district, you know, there, there's definitely a, a trend, um, you know, with people saying, well, we want to have conversations on topics that are important to us. This is that prime opportunity to have those conversations. And when we talk about how we're going to support that with some of the communication things, it's utilizing not just the channels we have, but doing it with purpose and, uh, and, and, and making sure the community has every opportunity to engage in those uh, in those opportunities that that are made available um, to support that, for example, uh, we started to roll it out with the school start time uh, community forum. We have a community at ojrsd.net email address. So, if there are specific questions or feedback that the community has and they're not quite sure where to send it, or if we have town hall meetings that don't, uh, uh, you know they're not quite sure what purview that falls under. That's an opportunity for them to ask questions where we can guide them to where the, either the information is or make sure that we are addressing some of those questions and concerns as well. Um, with, the, uh, with, with the feedback that we're using, yeah. it's, we are actively going out there and seeing what are, uh, what are the questions that we're getting via social media? What are the questions that our schools are receiving? I can tell you that one of the things that's being planned right now is meeting with a lot of those frontline employees who regularly are in communication with parents so we could figure out what, what are the holes that we have uh, you know, in our communication nets that we're casting. Um, for example, when there are school delays, are we making sure that they have all the resources they need that also addresses something like transportation? Some of those other things that they know who to contact with that um, to help organize it to make sure that we have a constant cascade of communication as well and that it's purposeful we have developed communication calendars uh, that will look into that so that includes social media it also includes milestones um, with the social media it's it's taking making sure that we have things everything accounted for from student uh, important student news that's coming up parent news opportunities for engagement it also includes uh, items that where maybe we have it on our website, but parents might not know where to find it or some of those other things where that's still a work in progress. So we're finding some of those issues and topics that parents want to discuss and making sure that they have the resources. And then if there is something that we can do to improve those resources that are available, we're taking that feedback as well to improve um, those, those tools that we have at our disposal. Um, one of the things we're going for with consistency as well is making sure that the schools have the resources that they need moving forward. So that includes archives, templates, uh, that they ha all have access to other communications that have gone out. Um, and that's also not just to make sure that we're more consistent with our communication, but that we're timely. So for example, if there is um, an incident that happens in the community, and one of our schools, because there's police activity in the air, it might be on a lockdown, making sure that we can communicate that effectively and clearly in a timely manner. 
you know, before rumors start, before parents start to generate some concerns or there's any misinformation out there, we want to make sure that we can communicate that effectively. And part of the benefits of having some of those archives and resources behind the scenes is that it allows school administration to focus on the school itself and not have to think through, okay, what, where do I start? I'm looking at a blank piece of paper, some of those things as well. Um, another priority for us that we're going to be taking a look at is consistently having a brand identity as a school district. Um, I will tell you just kind of doing a, you know, a quick overview. Um, we're not necessarily looking to, uh, you know, to reinvent the wheel, but we're making sure that we have the right tires on the vehicles that we're using. Um, with, for example, some of our logos. Um, over the years, we have different versions of the lo those logos, colors, things like that. That's an example of something we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page using as well. Um, and then finally, uh, reestablishing, if not creating, tools that we have. So we've had some social media channels that were dormant for a little while. We had an Instagram account that um, was dormant for about a year and a half. We recently reactivated that, uh, making sure that our digital publications are coming back now that, uh, you know, uh, now that I'm, I'm here full time working with staff to make sure that we can get that information out. That includes the return of the uh, advocate newsletter, keeping parents aware of what's going on, uh, as well as updating the school website. Um, some of you may have noticed already, and hopefully some of our community has noticed, rather than just having static pictures up front, those will actually take the community to information now, whether it's highlights or an important part of the website or a community section on the website where we can guide them. Um, and our social media channels as well, making sure that we are uh, responsive to questions that we have, but also making sure that they're aware of what resources are available for them. Uh, just a couple of comments on what some of the things you said. Um, you mentioned the calendars. I don't know exactly what you mean by enhancing the calendars, but when I look on like the high school calendar, for example, like I'll write on the homepage and I click calendar, in December, there appears to be no music concerts, and I'm sure that's not true so i just i've always found those calendars just not to have relevant stuff on it or just not the things that you know they just don't, aren't complete or you know there's nothing on there or whatever so that would just be um it'd be great just to click on calendar and be able to see everything that's going on <laughs> not just you know not to have to dig so hard so that's just my feedback on that um I'm about i'm also wondering about the advocate is that something that would go to all community members like it used to so people that don't have kids in the school kind of thing so we are currently transitioning that to a digital format. Um, the reason for that is uh, producing a print copy, actually sending mm -hmm. it to a publisher to present yeah. that. These it. days I can tell you um, upwards of several thousand dollars yeah. uh, for each issue. So over the course of doing them quarterly, four years. What we have done, understanding that there may be community members who um, do not have access to uh, to the digital version, uh, we uh, will, if, if, we if uh, an advocate is requested from the school district, we will print that and mail it to them. It actually still is a tremendous cost savings to the district mm -hmm. uh, in order for us to do that. I will tell you that with the last one that we had, we sent postcards out letting them know that it was available digitally. For the entire school district, I know we received less than 40 requests in total for the entire district for a print copy. Okay. Well, the reason I commented was just because, you know, we have these town halls, these community forums, like we have to make sure that people get the word out or the, they won't know that these yeah. things are happening. So um, is that the advocate, you know, how's yeah. that going to work? Yeah. And, the advocates, a, a quarterly update as well. And I, and that will dovetail a lot of, a lot of what we can do in real time is via our social media channels, via the website as mm -hmm. well. The advocate is kind of more of a quarterly uh, yeah. Re well, I remember the advocate as being something yeah. that had like fun things, yeah. you know, like, you know, which is nice, you know, it's good to say like, look what, how great we are over here. But um, it would be nice, though, that if there's just some surefire way that anybody in our community that wants to be involved in the school district knows how to how to communicate with us, is, even if they don't have kids in the school. And I know that's a tough one. We just have a hard time with that. But um, and finally, what you said about logos, I you know, I, I'm getting old, I don't have a great memory. I don't really remember why we use that little genie lamp thing <laughs> as our logo. So I think that, what is that thing again? <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> I, I think it's the lamp of learning, and I, I always joke you can tell between like 1956 and 1962, everyone with the lamp went with the lamp of learning, and so you see a lot of those. It's, it, there's a time period where it's kind of like wood paneling from the okay. 80s. You, you, you can you can tell where it's like okay, this is probably in this time period. Well, well. So anyway, so maybe that logo needs to you know, or there needs to be some understanding because I didn't know what it was. I, I don't know why I missed out on the lamp of learning. I. I I was born in 1969. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Well, for making, I never heard of that thing. I don't that's know what it the is. lava lamp of learning. For the, for your, for your. If we're well, going to make suggestions, you know the the newsletter that came out. I need a magnifying lens. Uh, and, and that that is exactly why we're trying to avoid that that as well. Um, it, it, it we can get a a. We know we feel that we can get a better quality print that is easier to read for the community. Um, at, a, at, a, at a better price point. So that's an example. Because anyone that's going to be reading it is going to need it to be yes, a it, it, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's. I will tell you that I, I had a few phone calls from members of the community where I was talking to them and I said, I'm just going to print you out a copy as well just because um, I'll, I'll do us both a favor because I, I know once I send it and, and, and we see it. So that's an example of an efficiency that we're, we're looking at where we can save money and do it better. So for those 40 people or whoever that you printed and mailed to the, now do they have to tell you the next time an advocate comes out? Or are you kind of like maintaining an ongoing list so you can keep sending? I them? think for, for, for that list, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that they, knowing that they have requested the print copies, we'll keep that going. And honestly, by the, by the time we factor in printing and, and mailing, um, it, it's a very nominal amount of money that we, we can send that to. I mean, I, I'll just tell you that we, we can, I know we can save the district. Uh, several thousand dollars with, with, with this approach. How often do, can you send those postcards in case you know new people want to sign up for that? Yeah, we, we, we can we can send that. Um, the advocate comes out quarterly, and so we, we can kind of do another round, a couple of rounds, several rounds of, of the postcards. Let people know that um, it, you know it's digital and who they can contact, and that's where that community at OJRSD uh, email address will come in. We'll, we're happy to take care of that for them. I just have a quick question. I know several months ago, I forget what, when it was done, but we did a communication survey out to the community. Um, are these goals addressing the majority of the feedback received in that survey? I know I didn't recall what the results of that survey were, but I just wanted to see, did you use that to inform these goals? Yes, a, a lot of what we have, and when we talk about in there, you know, having that community feel, we have the feedback already. You know, the community has let us know some of what they're looking for, and that drives the initiatives that we have on social media, it drives the initiatives that we have with the communication, how we are communicating some of those things. Um, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, the community has let us know what, uh, you know, what they're looking for from the website, what they're looking for from even Skylert you know, communication. So all of that touches upon <clears throat> on the feedback we've already received and will continue to receive. That's a big part of the community forums. We don't want it to just live in isolation for feedback we received in, in 2021. That That's going to be living and breathing and evolving as our community continues to give us feedback. Yeah, and Mr. Doherty, that feedback was part of the communication audit. So that survey went out as part of the audit. So we do have the audit that we refer to that helps guide our goals with communication as well. Um, sorry, if you met, talked about this. Um, a couple times we've talked about the fact that we don't have an, a, the ability to just like collect email addresses from everybody in our community or alumni or whatever. Um, I'm wondering if that's something we want to consider is allowing people to sign up for email like with their email address to get some news, you know, in some way that just as a regular feature, like, um, like some sort of newsletter on a regular basis, you know, you because we don't have and then we would have any email from anyone who wanted information like that on a regular basis. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, we wouldn't want somebody in the community to sign up to get every sky alert or every, you know, anything like that. But um, just general newsletters of some possibly or something so to get information out about oh we're having community forums on these nights or whatever I don't know something to consider yeah and and I will say too that um, we have already uh, 
the community forum was a good exercise in starting to set that up, lay the groundwork for that, where we've asked community, community members, regardless of whether or not they have a student in the school district, if they would like to receive updates on this, we've had some opt-in. So we can definitely continue to put that list together, continue to get the word out and build something um, when we have those, you know, whether it's a, it's a community wide topic that we want to get out there or just simply letting them know that the latest newsletter is out, you know, for the quarter. So we can definitely build that. Okay, great. Thanks. So in terms of measures, um, all community Facebook groups will accurately reflect all the information now and <laughs> in, in, inherent to the future. No, that thing. But talking about measures, I will tell you that, you know, uh, Dr. Stout and I have already uh, you know, gone over, you know, just, I've, I've shown them just some preliminary numbers that we can track to see everything from uh, engagements that we're getting, shares, you know, there's there's data we can pull from the website. So we do have both uh, qualitative uh, feedback and data that we can take in as well as quantitative where we can see if we're hitting those targets or which uh, posts or which areas are performing better than others. Yeah, great, thanks. Michael has helped to increase my Twitter presence. So i uh, been getting a lot more likes and hits on Twitter. So thank you for that, Michael. Um, 17, I think. Yeah, I don't know what the number is, but we, we, we'll, we have that for you. I know it's better than last year. Yeah, when, when you go to from one to 10, that's yeah. like a 900% improvement, right? Yes, exactly. All right. we. Uh... Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it, and we have several new board members here. So we did a, we did a different approach this year than we did last year. Uh, and we really talked about them here at, at this meeting. Last year, we, we had a workshop where we, we did some of this work. So as we move forward, I'll be interested in just getting some, some feedback from folks, too, uh, regarding the, the process. I mean, we had a lot of discussion here. We'll go back with our team and look at all that feedback and developing the goals. But I am interested in moving forward, getting some feedback. Um, if we would prefer to do it like this and have these conversations, or if we prefer, prefer to do like a workshop and then share our goals publicly. So again, that's something we can talk about as we move forward. So it's a different format than we used last year. Yeah, I'll just say one, one thing I think we should do is take these goals as a leaping off point at the end of the year. And as we evaluate how we did against the goals, jump right into the, the following year's goals and see, you know, because I think if we're trying to be consistent, which is good, and we should probably have a goal to come back into the school year with the goals in place. If that, that would be a goal I'd add to our mix for, for our goals. Um, with that, should we move on to yep. finance? All right, let's get into finance. Over to you, David. Good evening. Uh, we've got two agenda items tonight. Uh, one is approval of the meeting minutes from our uh august 29th uh building and ground committee meeting uh, so those will be pushed forward to the uh agenda for the regular meeting do we need like a motion for that or yes please i have a motion so moved. Moved. Yep, second okay and then uh, our second topic tonight is uh to look uh, back at that 2019 feasibility study and uh, see what we want to do with it. So if you go into the uh, uh, board docs, we've got three documents here. We've got the uh, uh, feasibility study report, and we've got an executive summary for that, and then we've got the feasibility study schedule. And uh, if you pull up that schedule, are we, we going to do a formal presentation on this? Or just it's a working kind of, session, okay, gotcha. so we really weren't. But I'm can we, to can we throw that up on the... Big screen, the schedule. Thanks. All right, so uh, uh, this is the schedule that was developed back in uh, 2019. It's a 10-year schedule, and um, there's, uh, I'll wait for Paul to get it up so everybody can follow along. Oops. Hide his password. <laughs> Wildcat seventy two. <laughs> 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 
Thanks, thanks, Paul. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking at. So, uh, so this is the schedule. It's a ten-year schedule. There's two pages: five years on page one, and uh, years six through ten on page two. And um, uh, we've gone through and kind of crossed off all the things that have been accomplished already. You can see some of these things, you know, have happened over the last two or three years, and uh, have been taken care of, like the building envelope stuff. Uh, the ATC, the high school chillers project was underway. Uh, the CCT, CCTV stuff that's uh, going out to bid now in October. So we don't have to worry about that in the planning sessions. Um, some things on here are, are um, ongoing. It's a, you know, kind of a reoccurring, usually a, uh, reoccurring thing. This architectural finishes uh, project here in the uh, what color is that? Like a light brown. Um, so that's like a yearly thing where just things have to get cleaned up and and, and put back together. Um, Wi-Fi is on here in the purple on the bottom, so that's gonna you know going out to bid now. Uh, so I think like what we really need to look at is this stuff that's up top in the first uh, in in the green. So these are some items that the 2019 um, feasibility study addressed. And uh, maybe we want to relook at these. Maybe we want to reorder them somewhat. Um, so we're just kind of like open to suggestions, I think, at this point. So we've got the middle school cafeteria expansion. Uh, we've got the middle school auditorium uh, expansion. We've got the main campus traffic pattern study, which uh, is underway. Um, and we're supposed to have a revision on that in the next week or two, I guess. Uh, the traffic study, the traffic right? study, right? The traffic yeah. study, which isn't necessarily um, hiring the civil engineers and the architects for the project, but it will inform. It will inform right. that. And then, as we move uh, to the second page, years six through ten, we've got uh, we're getting into the high school performing arts wing, uh, design and construction, uh, high school gym construction, uh, athletic addition, uh, stadium lockers. Uh, we've got West Vincent traffic pattern on here. Maybe I think they've done some changes there already. Not physical, but they've done some operational right. changes at West Vincent. Right, some of the low-hanging fruit, for yeah. sure. Um, and FCES, uh, additional classrooms construction. So, um, like I said, uh, we're kind of like looking at these items and do it. You know, do we want to you know change the priorities on some of these items, and then you know. Also, the other thing we have to think about is, you know, if we do go with um, an earlier school start, how is that going to affect, you know, the priority of these items? Um, you know, I think, you know, a big concern here is traffic flow at the main campus and, um, you know, changing that school start time. You know, we've been kicking around some different ideas, I guess, uh, how that can affect the traffic flow. Uh, and, and with that, you know, we, in the traffic study that's coming, there's a, a menu of items. Uh, I don't know if you've reviewed, reviewed the draft yet or not, but you know, they kind of give up, you know, some of the stuff's like low hanging fruit where you can just, you know, it's more administrative controls, you know, direct traffic in different ways or, or some different timing stuff. And then uh, some of it upgrades to, you know, rearranging parking lots or putting in extra driveways or turn lanes or whatever. So, um, you know, we won't want to go and do some of those larger projects until we have, you know, exhausted the, uh, you know, kind of easier uh, things and see how those affect it. But then also with school traffic time, uh, you know, one thing that the study has already identified is that the peak commuting time for this area coincides with the 15 minute peak traffic time for this campus. And so if we go with a low, lower school start, and, and one thing we're not sure about is, is that commuting time driven by the start of school? Because most you know, parents are just going to school when their kids are going to work, when their kids go to school, or are those like, you know, how related are those two events? Um, so if we you know, adjust school start time, will peak commuting traffic time stay the same or not? So we're kind of waiting to kind of find out if uh, our traffic consultants can give us a little more insight on that, so. Um, Oh, Jackie, do you want to add anything else? I think I kind of 
Um, sure, just to give an update on the traffic study, I think that would be appropriate to do now. We're really just waiting for them to finalize the impact of delayed start because they are looking at that as part of this. Um, and then some more, we're looking for them to prioritize some of their recommendations based on what we should try first. Um, the least costly way uh, at looking at the, the main campus traffic flows. And then dealing with also our internal intersections. Th those are issues on the main campus as well. So it's not just the traffic coming on, but we've got some internal intersections that we're asking them for specific recommendations for. So that will inform um, this. I think the only other thing that I would like to add, and obviously we want your feedback, um, a couple of thoughts. One, um, I believe it would behoove us. We had K&W engineers work with us on the feasibility study when it was done, and it was completed in September of 2019. And they did provide us with some options, and they did really look at the flows on our campus um, and worked with the architect at the time. I would like for them to do um, the engineering calculations that would provide us with the pervious surface calculations because we <laughs> we have a lot going on on this main campus and in order for us to go anywhere that is already not building or pavement we need to know how much we're allowed to, to do that based on our pervious surface calculations that's the water runoff pavement versus grass so if the committee is comfortable I think that's where we should start because we know that the traffic patterns are were a major concern and that was brought up so and anything that we would want to do on the main campus and a lot of these recommendations are related to the main campus so I think that it would behoove us to get those calculations done so if the committee is comfortable with that we just wanted to make sure we can move forward with doing that um, and then the other piece of that is when the enrollment projections come in and I know Mr. Benton will, will have those next month for you um, we would like to marry that up with and really basically ask Schrader for a proposal Schrader architects are working on our um, the high school project right now for a proposal to help us work through the process of, re, of prior you know, is it the same you know they could lead some community input exercises as well are we going to go down the same path, have priorities adjusted, and also to dovetail with the enrollment projections to make sure that we're planning appropriately for the next 10 years. So if you're comfortable with that, we'll, we'll get a proposal for that as well. Because I think it'll take some dialogue um, to, to look at this top section. The bottom section, like Dave said, uh, we were able to do the Giza project and pick up a lot of that. Um, when it was a financially good time to do that. And so there's much of this that's already done or in process. The top part is really the, the additional, in addition to the enrollment driven decisions that we must answer for capacity uh, are, are the wants and needs and desires of the community and the staff and the parents and the, and the school board. Right, so when we're looking at this, mm -hmm. your one looks empty, but I, I don't see like the, LGI and library project on here at all. That was already started prior to this being right. done. But so is year one this year and we are finishing those items in year one or They're really, we, where do they fall on this? Those projects were already approved in the budget prior to doing the feasibility study. So they weren't, they weren't, they were already a given <laughs> that we were doing those. This was above and beyond those those two, the high school LGI project. So would it be possible to have a like a perspective that actually shows what is already committed to, and then we map out the years after that commitment? What do you mean? Because I mean, I think we're uh, the feasibility is a forward-looking mm -hmm. future plan. So year one is next year I, I guess I'm could I'm be 20 years from now what year, year one is, one whenever, is it whenever it happens so it could be a thousand years from now 10 years from now a year from now next month so it's just when we're going to do something in the future that's the starting line that's year one so this is all about the future of the school district's capital planning looking forward and saying and there's there's a couple drivers to this so one of the most important drivers is going to be the, the population growth. And that's going to force us I, to do I stuff. I get all that. I just don't, I, I need to understand year one being blank. That's all. 
So year that's the year when we're really getting the, the bids planning. and everything for things that happen in year two? Not even getting the bids. We're doing what we're doing now. No. <laughs> getting a jumping off point, okay, so um, hiring the consultants, <laughs> doing design development, reprioritizing. <laughs> so year one is really just, you're starting to get the ball rolling. Does that make sense? They really didn't start when they were doing this. Right. They didn't, they didn't so, put any years to this. They're so just if saying, have, year one, you need time to get things going. And then so if we have stuff that's actually already on the schedule and and predicted to have a timeline is there any way we can just get a visual maybe not the feasibility study but oh. you know just just a visual of when that timeline happens because we've already committed to it sure we have a five-year capital plan in the budget where we really reevaluate it every year so I'm happy to I'm happy to send that to you so that's in that's where I should look for what we've already committed to Mm -hmm. Correct. If you look at 22, okay. 23, if you want to use that as year one, it just depends on what the board decides. Um, you'll see that we're working through the items that are in 22, 23. That's what we're working on now. And then in our five year plan, are there other things already committed to in 23, 24, or 24, 25 that would prevent us from taking on? Most of them are these items. Okay. And not all of these items. I guess that's where I'm having trouble yeah. understanding how they integrate because, yeah, some of the stuff here is taken care of and some of it isn't. <laughs> well, think about it. Nothing's committed to after this year, right? So until the board votes and says, mm -hmm. here's $2 million for XYZ project and you sign the contract, there's no commitment. Right. So you can change your mind. So, so think about could this. We have LGI on here because we haven't committed to it yet then. Yeah, I mean, we're, <laughs> but technically, I guess. But but in terms of um, what, what I, but I, I think we're having a semantic conversation here. I think do we want to? We have to do a ten-year plan, and we're think, talking about the big capital uh, things that we're going to do as an organization, and what's driving those capital decisions. And those capital decisions are going to be have to be made. And we did this study a few years ago, and then COVID happened. So the question is, now that we're going to have new population numbers, it may change, in fact, automatically change some of our priorities just because of that, and it may change the scope of some of those priorities based on that. So we're going to have to reevaluate our, both our five-year plan and 10-year plan, you know, call it whatever, however you want to do it. The, the, the starting point and, and the ask is this. We have a couple preliminary studies to do in order to better inform our decision making on the 10 year plan, the traffic study, the, the, the architectural study, the plans and the population growth. So that's a an ask right now from the finance committee to say, let's go forward and do those things that will inform what we're going to be asked to be making decisions on from a capital point of view. And then step two of that is once we have that information. What's the process? What's the what's how do we want to proceed in order to involve the public and the board and the stakeholders in evaluating those priorities? They may stay the same, they may be different, they may complete we may do anything we want, right? So we're starting blank and saying, okay, now do we want to challenge our priorities that we had from 2019? What is forced, to, you know, what we know are changing because of the data change. And, and let's get going in that. So I think the, the immediate ask we need to do is to say, finance committee, go forward with gathering that data from the traffic study, the architectural um, calculations that'll do impervious service because they're gonna drive what we can and cannot do, or if we had a, you might have to acquire property in order to meet that, you know, if you wanted to, let's say, change the lane. So there's a lot of what ifs. So, so the first ask, let's do that. So I think you gotta, decide as a, as a board, as a committee, to go ahead and, and give the administration a guidance to go forward with those data collection points, which will inform everything else. Right, and my feedback is just that having, you know, a plan that has the future, but it doesn't have all of the, what, it, like it's not updated to show the situation now is not as helpful as if we had something that did have, you know, like the, the LGI and, library included because then you know that that informs then you know how much lead time we need to finish out those things that we've already started 
down this road before we want to start the next one so we're not doing everything at once you know that so that that the start i don't think it's that. sequential with the library i mean just to be honest with you i don't i think this well, is completely I, just, I can't i i'm very visual it helps me to see the blocks it really helps me to see the colored blocks on a, a grid <laughs> that's all so what i think like so these these items are are, are not staked to any specific date right and right so the lgi is already staked to a date and so that's what I'm would, interested you, in seeing. If you put so the LGI on here, it looks like we're starting the cafeteria in 18 months, which we're not. Right. So, so I need to go look at the five-year plan, and what else will the five-year plan have on it besides the LGI and the cafeteria? I can answer that question. So we've completed most of the larger items that have been in the five-year plan up through 22-23. So that includes the Giza project that was fi finished over the summer, the energy mm -hmm. savings project. Um, we renovated the old, the former East Coventry Elementary School. We still have the other half of that to consider. Remember, we only renovated a portion of it. So that should be something that is considered in this in this plan because we're right. really gonna revamp this, really. Right, exactly. This is just so saying, this is where we were in 2019 when we revamp it will we be able to put the remainder of those projects that we've not actually done yet onto a plan so that we can see all the colored blocks together sure and the the only items left really are because we put a halt to it um, the high school library and lgi all of the other items okay. they're not green items so they are ongoing mechanical type items that we have to maintain so and some of those are capital but, but they are in the plan, and I'm happy to review it with you, too, so that you could see. Okay. And that's actually why we tried to go back and cross off so that you could see, okay, right. this was done. This is going out to bid. These are not done yet. And some things, for example, West Vincent Chillers, we monitor them on an ongoing basis. They may last longer than another year or two. So there, things will shift. It's not set in stone. Right. Um, but we just want to make sure we're all on the same page with respect to our priorities and a plan for the future for the district. Right, and I, I am just expressing my hope that we will have a new colored block spreadsheet at some point that shows us like where we are now as opposed to the 2019 with X's on it, that's all. And I think that's part of what we would ask Schrader to do. So when yeah. we get a proposal from Schrader, we're gonna have them take this, the enrollment projections, um, feedback that we receive from the committee and the board and the community and we'll I think we're looking for a new green section of this particular document if that makes sense yeah and I think everybody is pretty much in agreement that the traffic stuff is a big priority because any person who drives here any day that school is in session has that concern right, right. and that would be why I'm asking for <laughs> yeah. for us to have the engineer do the calculations on the previous surface so that we know what our jumping off point is wouldn't we need that if we were considering a middle school, any of the other extensions, we would need that information anyway? Absolutely. I, I, exactly. So it, in order to plan for those future things, any of them. I mean, you can build on top of parking lot. You may, you, you're better off and your numbers will look better. Um, but it's anywhere where we would touch grass or undeveloped surface. When, when are we going to get a, an updated cost estimate because these things have changed probably by 10 percent right and so that is part of what we would ask schrader so the proposal from the architect that i would be requesting and tell me if you'd like to add anything to this would be to work with k and w who is going to do the pervious surface calculations utilize this report the traffic study the transportation study um, and our enrollment projections and really come back First, we have to work through what the priorities are, and then once that's solidified, then we would obtain new cost estimates from them. We absolutely need that. You're 100% right. Is there anything else you can think of as far as next steps? Those are the two things that I that I have on. Yeah, or some other or, or some other project that's not listed here right. that you know. Well, I, th I think you got to get the first steps before we deep into, because then we're going to get hypothetical and speculative and without any data, and that, that could be a wild juice, ju uh, goose chase. Can't speak. Um, 
and my grandson, so I got juice on the mind. So um, I, I think population study, traffic study, and because that's going to inform what we have the haves to do, like we have no choice in, right? Once we have the no choices of what we need to do and we understand the budget implications of the things that are driven by the population growth and the choice, then we can say, okay, given that, let's revisit the the bigger ticket items and saying, you know, when are we going to build the wrestling room? When are we going to build the this? Well, you know, the music hall, like the orchestra hall. I, you know, I'm, I'm being facetious, but until we have that, what do we have to do and what that cost is going to be incurred into the district and what those implications of that footprint, we, you know, we have the, we know we have a bottleneck in the middle school, um, in the cafeteria, let's say. But if we have 500 more students coming in there, then what we would have expanded to this year versus now based on that number might be two different uh, building envelopes, right? So, and it might be two different costs. So I think we, we got to do the first step first and then come back and revisit what other um, capital plans are likely to be hitting the buildings and the facilities over the next five to 10 years that we then, and then get public input. Where does the, the community want to invest the money in the school district? You know, where does that happen? I think that to me is the order of the operation. Right, and what I remember of our study, our population study that was most recent was that the middle school bubble was actually transferring to the high school now and that we would not be seeing another bubble like that. So we would definitely want to know if the, the newest predictions change that trend. I think that that's probably the most key thing because I think at the time that this was drawn up, we were kind of hoping that maybe there was a chance to get the middle school improved before that bubble was all through there, but we cl clearly missed that, right? <laughs> Right, and just to take you back a bit, in the, the, this study, this feasibility study was done in the fall of 2019. We had it on the agenda in February of 2020 to begin going down this road. And in March of 2020, COVID happened. So really everything was just stopped. So we're just trying to get back to normal and back to our regular sense of long-term planning because it's really important for the district to plan for long-term. Things can't happen on a dime. Need any action on that or we'll just go? No, I just want to make sure everybody's comfortable and we'll move forward sure. with obtaining those yep. things to bring back to you. All right. Let's uh thank you. I'm gonna ask I'm gonna just ask real quickly then if there's any public questions on anything that we went over tonight. Heather. I just first back on the um, goals. I know Colleen was here and she left, but she wanted to know why IST um, is at the elementary level when MTSS is at the secondary level because she wanted to say that she didn't understand why it wasn't there because she thought it would be more beneficial for consistency and transfer to the higher level. Um, that was her question. Okay. I have so many questions, but I just, I want to ask, like, do you guys really understand what happened at the feasibility study? Because I know some of you participated in it, and that was probably the largest community gathering and intentional effort to involve people in this district. And there were township people, there were so many people that came in, um, teachers, employees, Student, uh, I, I think students were in there too, but parents and community people, and we put post-it notes all around the cafeteria. So, Is there a question the things, in there? Yeah, I asked if you really understand it because a couple of those things that are on there, we don't have a full-size gym. We don't have a full, the cafeteria was a problem at the middle school. And you don't so, have, to, you, and the performing arts wing was very, very important. So. My question is, do you understand how important that was to the people in this district? Yeah, I, I, I do. I have a confidence level that our administration and the team that understands that. As far as the MTSS and the ITS, IST, IST yeah, I, I mean, I think we could, you know, get, get it. It's a good question. We should, you know, and my other, back on that. I have another know. question on the communications committee. So. And a, and a comment. I am on social media, so I can I can see what you're doing. I can see um, Dr. Stout how you're doing that. But I I would ask the question on behalf of 
the older people in the community, there is no newspaper here really anymore. The mercury doesn't even deliver. So when you are cutting out um, the advocate, it really is hurtful to those older people. That's literally, there are so many of them in pockets, that's out how they get it. So even if they didn't call back in to say, I want it, I want it digitally, they wouldn't get it. And also, um, I don't actually even know if I got, I don't, I don't get anything. Like, I don't even know that I get anything email. The email's been a problem, and I, I feel like I will just email you directly my concerns that we had from the communications committee. Um, thank you. Thanks, Heather. Anyone on Zoom? Oh, Rick. Just a simple, quick question. <clears throat> when we lose a child to like an alternate education, Jackie, I think you said there's 83 different schools that we have to bus to or something like that last last month, you said? It's actually a little bit less than that. Okay, it's, it's I, don't, a, I don't know but exactly. But it's like 56. I, I went back and checked. We range over time, and sometimes we're higher and sometimes we're lower. We're at 56 right. exactly this year. Uh, well, this is pertaining to communication. When we do lose ch children, especially, for example, like homeschool, do we reach out to these parents and ask why they chose this, chose this alternate education? I mean, are we honest with ourselves when we get these answers? Because I've heard plenty of times where people said bullying, and bullying is a very big deal. But I think a lot of these problems coming to our school district, like we're talking about an increase in numbers, we're losing a substantial number of children. And I've met parents who, I'll give you a perfect example, I stopped to get a glass of lemonade and a lemonade stand from a little kid, and the mom was like, I'm very disappointed. We just moved here and we expected a good school district and everything we're hearing is not what we planned and we've already put our children in a Catholic school. This is happening a lot and are, are we honest with ourselves about why this is happening? I mean, we're looking at projecting these numbers larger. How many kids are we losing every year? I don't know if you have that number, if it's, you know, we should know as a school district how many kids live in our district you and where they're yeah, so, so the, the administration, we do have the, the number that we, we have in other schools. And uh, I know at least with the, the charter schools, there's a reach out program with the private, like the Catholic school. I don't know. I, maybe Dr. Stout could answer that better. Right, yeah. Rec, typically, like for, for charter cyber schools, it's that we do reach out and, and, and for the reasons that we do know the students that go there. Typically, students that choose Catholic schools or parochial schools, we, we do not. I figured that's a personal choice, even for homeschooling. Uh, if you choose to, to uh, homeschool your child, we don't reach out, but I would entertain a conversation with anyone that would want to talk to me about it. Well, we think, feel some of those are just personal decisions. Well, I, I do think maybe as a school district, we should be reaching out to these people to see why they chose, they're paying taxes for this district. They chose this district for a reason, and now they're making a choice to to do their education elsewhere. Maybe we should be reaching out to these people because maybe this is one of our goals is not to lose as many children. I, I don't know if that's a stupid question or, a, I, but I just think we're, we're a better school district than what, than what we're portraying. We just, we, we're losing a lot of kids. So that's all. No, Thanks. Thank, thank you. I don't think it would hurt to reach out to anybody really. Yeah, again, you know, you know, families, families have their own personal reasons for making decisions. A lot of times, the, the, obviously, the charter schools, that's a financial implication to the school district when students leave to go to a charter school. If a student leaves to go to a parochial school or homeschooling, that's not a, a financial cost to us. Uh, but again, I mean, I, I, just, I, want, I want all the students to come here. Yeah, it could be a simple exit interview, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, hey, what, what, what are the things that we did great and what are the things that we could improve on? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think especially if the child was here and left. I think it's different if someone just, hey, I'm going to Catholic school because I'm sure. Catholic and, you know, it's you know, what I did. But if it's, I was here and I left, I think, I think that exit interview, I think that's a good point. Yeah. And certainly enrollment, like total enrollment versus the total eligible kids, that's a number we will have. We could actually just look at that in terms that's of a great, like, a, that's like, a great measurable like, metric That's just too. a measurable we could do that'll just give us an indication if we just have eligible versus attended. I think they, they were doing the exit interview and then calling kids, trying to get them back um, after COVID. I know right. that was very yeah. active. Yeah. Um, and I think we, we can look at, especially now look at how many kids do we have that left the district and has that number increased? Has it stayed steady? Has it decreased? Like, I think we should know 
based on our population numbers, if our population's grown, you know, what that looks like. Yeah, I, I do know, and, and I just saw it recently, our, our cyber enrollment uh, is, is down. So we have less kids going to cyber charter schools than we did during the pandemic. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's, I think it's, it's a good metric we yeah. should. Yeah. Oh, I just have a, one thing, it's more informational. Um, Mr. Doherty had asked about what's, does the high school doing anything with the anxiety and the stress academically and those goals and just, I'll let you know some of the great stuff our SAP team is doing at the high school. They're, they're running groups with kids, uh, one's called Anxiety Slayers for kids with anxiety and, and problems in school. They have uh, one called Smart But Scattered about helping kids organize their thoughts and the kids can sign up for these groups. Another one about adjusting to the high school for ninth graders. So it's things kids can sign up for on their own or a teacher can recommend them to that. This one, just let you guys know about some of the some of the good things that are happening there. That they've, uh, I think, we've even hired some extra mental health clinicians and stuff this year too. Other, uh, I think, are addressing some of those issues. So, not anything you put in a plan or anything. I just wanted to let you know some of those things that are going on. Thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> anything on Zoom? Oh, all right. We're out of here.